So everybody, please take your seats so that we can get started. So first of all, welcome everybody to the second day of the UPU World Leaders Forum. Great that you're here with us today, that you're joining us. Please don't join us just in person listening, but uh, when we come to the discussions, please raise your hands, get involved, ask questions, make comments, whatever you think fit. We would like this to be a very interactive event if possible. My name is Bernhard Bugovts. I'm the founder of the Postal Innovation Platform and Connect to Post. So yesterday, for example, I was not here, unfortunately, because I had my own event on one of the stages uh, in the Expo Hall with our startup competition, our annual. Um, but I'm very happy. Uh, to be here with you today. So if you were waiting for Amanda, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's me today. Um, you, the, those of you that have been here uh, yesterday, you have seen the format. So in the morning, we have two sessions. These are vision sessions. So we'll look more at uh, visionary discussions. And in the afternoon, we go a bit more into details. We have more strategic uh, sessions. Yesterday, the focus was on logistics and cross-border e-commerce. Today, we are focusing uh, and diversification, of course. And today we are focusing on trust and security and sustainability. Two topics that are really, really very important now. They have been grown in importance over the past few years, and today nobody would deny that they are really key to the industry. Um, one announcement for uh, the coffee break, which we are going to have. Uh, so if you have some time, you can go to the UPU booth. You have Mail Americas there. The guys will offer you some free coffee and chat with you and explain to you what they are doing and how they can help you or benefit you in your organizations. We are going to start with our first panel here today, which is on sustainability. And as I already said, this is really one of the key topics everybody is discussing right now. And also the focus of the UPU is very much on sustainability. And as we all know, there are a lot of challenges, uh, sustainability challenges that the industry is facing technological challenges, operational challenges, you name it. Um, and when we look at all those challenges, they are numerous. So you, you have, of course, everything that has something to do with the climate, emissions, going net zero. You have everything that's connected to kind of the products that we are using, waste, for example, and other elements. We are thinking about models, how can we introduce, in order to avoid waste, some circular economy, for example. Many, many, many elements are in there. And you see that all postal operators and also together with the UPU are trying to find the right answers to that. And this is also what we are trying to solve here in this, in this panel. One thing is clear, when you try to solve all the areas of the sustainability challenges, you need a holistic approach. It's not just done with uh, here a measure or there a measure. You must have a holistic approach and you must really incorporate sustainability into your overall strategy. Now, I would like to introduce you to the panel. Our panelists here are today, I start over there with Elena. Elena Fernandez, she's uh, the uh, chairperson of uh, the board of directors of Post Europe, but she's also responsible for ESG at Koreas. Joao Bento, he is the CEO of uh, City Portugal and Charles Brewer, the CEO of Post Malaysia. So thank you very much for joining me here today. Now I sit down here together with you and I would like uh, to start with you, Charles, and maybe you can tell us a bit more about, I mean, you have just uh, launched your sustainability roadmap. So what is, uh, what, yeah, what sure. role does sustainability play for Post Malaysia and what are you doing? Please. Please. Very good to see you. And good morning, everyone. I, and good morning, DJ. I met to you last night for the first time. It was a pleasure. Um, and uh, for those I haven't met before, so as mentioned, my name's Charles, and I, I run, very proudly run Post Malaysia, um, which is a fantastic organization, a fantastic company. Uh, we were talking about brand quite a bit last night, and lots of sort of, uh, sort of nuances around your brand, that, what comes with it from a passion and love perspective, but also years and years of history. We have more than 200 year history. And as you imagine, the coin has both sides positives and negatives. But uh, to the point and to today's discussion, so Post Malaysia is going through a, a significant uh, transformation, a significant transformation. I don't underestimate that for one second, but a key part of that uh, transformation is around sustainability. And, you know, we were talking about it just before I came in, actually. And, um, you know, to the point on sustainability, you don't have to look too far for the reason why, you know, to answer the question why. If you just look at the last two or three months in terms of fires, floods, and all sorts of other events, even two days ago, announcements saying that they think it's too late in terms of stopping the, the, um, 
the ice cap melting or the east part, east coast of the, uh, the ice cap melting. So, you know, there's plenty of reasons why. But number one, you have to be super uber passionate about any part of transformation, but in particular, around, I think, sustainability, because it has uh, a lot of questions around it. Uh, certainly from some of my board members, perhaps I'll talk about that uh, a little bit later in terms of the cost challenges of a sustainability journey, but not impossible. But to the point, let me take you through. I'm going to go run through this really fast uh, and then I finish on a video. You know, Post Malaysia never comes to the stage without a video. We have a nice video which hopefully makes your hair stand up and you get super passionate about Post Malaysia in the same way that I am. But to our journey. So yeah, very simplistically, and you know, I promised Data Alley, so our regulators in the room uh, and the post before my promised Data Alley and others of our regulator that what, as we were going through this transformation, we would also consider how we do that sustainably. How do we change a 200 year old company? Think about sort of our, our purpose statement, which is all about being passionate to connect lives for a better tomorrow. So, really thinking about how do we deliver on that purpose statement. So sustainability sits very neatly and nicely in the middle of our strategic transformation. Um, we came out uh, and made a commitment uh, with uh, the minister in March of this year where we would be net zero uh, by 2050. And as I think mentioned a couple of times yesterday, easy to put on a slide, a little bit harder in action. And I'll talk a bit about that in a second. We, we have a very, we developed a very executable plan um, we worked with a consultant on that and uh, we have a plan that I said that takes us through to net zero um, and we we use the three C's on a very regular basis so the capability of the organization so if you're going through a significant transformation one of the questions you sort of have to ask yourself is does the organization have the capacity to be able to uh, deliver on that transformation plan. That's a really key one for us. You've got multiple things going on. So Tiru, who's in a room somewhere, is responsible for transportation and therefore a big part of this is under his remit, but he has 101 things to do on a daily basis. So that's really a key one for us is the capacity of the organization, the capability of providers. And again, I know it's really, really different in Europe, but in Malaysia, when we started this journey, as an example, there was one bike provider, EV bike provider, and no van provider. So as you start on that journey of how are we going to do this, do, do, you know, does the organization or does the country you operate in have the capability to be able to provide what you want to do? Uh, now, that's changed significantly and changing faster. And again, I'll talk about that in one second. And then the last one is cost. You know, So uh, like many postal operators, uh, we don't run at a profit, unfortunately. And so when I first introduced this and first presented it to the board and first presented it to our CFO, a sort of a, you know, get that sort of crook neck look from various people saying, well, how much is this going to cost us? You know, what's the cost? And I'll talk a bit about that later, but I'm really, really super pleased with how we've sort of gone at that. So, but we use those three C's on a regular basis. So that's our plan. Um, by 2030, we have, a, oh, sorry, 2025, we have a couple of milestones that we're aiming for. We're on track as we speak right now. Um, this is the launch that we had in March. With the minister, you see him there waving the Malaysian flag very proudly with me 26 kilos heavier uh, than I am now, which is, I quite like seeing that photo actually. Um, but anyway, so uh, that was our launch. We're really proud. We were the first um, logistics organization, Malaysian logistics organization to commit to net zero. And, and the reason it's relevant, and again, uh, with Data Rally in the room, I'll, I'll mention it, that, and I've mentioned this a few times, that and I think it's true whichever country you operate in, but even more true for more embryonic uh, countries. The government, the country, your employees, the businesses are looking for lighthouse examples. They need someone to be brave. They need someone to take that first step and others will follow. That, and that's my view on this, that as we've gone down this route, and I'm already hearing lots and lots of chatter from our competitors. In fact, one of them just announced a net zero commitment too. So. But that's good. It's good because we've taken that first step and now others will follow. So really very proud of what we've done. Uh, just running through, we have six work streams um, under our sustainability roadmap. So obviously delivery methods. So we have about 5,000 uh, two-wheel bikes in Malaysia. Very old, chucking out a lot of CO2. Um, and the plan is to convert that fleet as mentioned here, convert that fleet pretty quickly. And we're already 156 bikes in, I think, already uh, done. Uh, by the end of this year, it'll be 200 plus. Um, and so that's going in the right direction. Similarly with vans. So like I mentioned, when we first started this journey, there was no uh, vans available in Malaysia. Um, now we have 
uh, six suppliers of vans. So this thing changes really, really fast. We took our first delivery of our electric vans last week, uh, or formally last week. And again, by the end of this year, we'll have 150 plus uh, of EV vans. So uh, making really, really good progress. The other thing about this is uh, it's not just about the vehicles that you use. It's also about um, how you use them, because we still have a lot of ICE vehicles on the road until we do the 100% conversion. So we're putting telematics into all of our vehicles, which is good in terms of clean and green, but it's also really good in terms of safety. If, you, if For those who are not so familiar, telematics is a fantastic tool that allows us to improve the way our drivers drive um, and makes them a little bit safer too. So that's on track two. Uh, this one's super. We get a lot of sun in Malaysia. Anybody been to Malaysia? Apart from Data Ali? You can't, you can't put your hand up, Rafida. So Malaysia is a really fantastic country. My mother once asked me, what's the seasons in Malaysia? I said, they have two seasons, hot and hotter. Um, and we get a lot of sun. So solar panels is a really fantastic for us. We have 600 plus buildings. So we've already put solar panels on our three largest buildings, including our salt centers. By the end of this year, we'll have another 17 locations generating the power. And that's really, it's really effective, not just in terms of, and, and next year, another 100 plus. So it's really good in terms of converting our energy to be clean and green. But going back to the vehicles, you know, the, the energy that's produced in Malaysia is still not green um, completely. So, so um, we want to generate our, a cleaner, greener energy for our fleet. So, so we're doing that too, which is really cool. Um, and then a few other things. So like everybody, um, online ordering is enormous and um, a lot of plastic landfill is created. So we've converted all of our, our packaging now um, across, or we are in the process of converting all our packaging across to being recycled, um, which is excellent. Uh, waste, we were, where's Fiona? It was about 5 million reams of paper we were, we were destroying on a regular basis, and we've reduced that by 50% already. And that also fits in with the digitalization story, so that customer journey and making it more, more electronic, more digital. So that's, that's one supports the other, so that's in play. And last but not least, with two minutes to go, I'll show you a very nice video which includes lots of shots of Malaysia, which is really nice. So hopefully it plays. In the heart of Southeast Asia lies a country rich in natural beauty and biodiversity, Malaysia. A land where tradition marries modernity and where sustainability isn't just a trend but a pledge to future generations. At the heart of this promise is Post Malaysia, an organization that has existed over the last two centuries, interwoven with the nation's fabric, now on a mission to redefine its legacy. Our operation touches over 11 million addresses, serving over 30 million Malaysians across the nation every day. And with this extensive reach, comes the responsibility to operate in harmony with the environment. Aligned with national and global sustainability goals, Post Malaysia is committed to achieving net zero emissions by the year 2050. In March 2023, we proudly launched our sustainability roadmap, demonstrating our full dedication to 30% reduction of our scope 1 and 2 carbon emissions by 2025, with focus on six work streams delivery methods, fleet optimization, green buildings, waste management, eco consumerism, and digital learning. Achieving this goal won't be easy. But by transitioning all our last mile vehicles to electric by 2030 and equipping over 400 of our facilities with solar PV technology, we are confident in our path towards fulfilling our ambitions. While we strive to ensure the growth of our business, we are committed to ensuring that this growth is managed in an impactful and fully sustainable way. To attain our sustainability objectives and uphold our promises, we are guided by three core categories. Post green, post forward, and post care. With each parcel delivered and every letter sent, Post Malaysia plays a vital role in connecting people and businesses throughout the country. We take pride in having Malaysia's largest electric fleet and remain dedicated to the goal of achieving 100% electrification of our last mile vehicles by 2030. Our commitment to sustainability goes beyond our road fleet. We are also in the process of transforming our premises. This transformation includes generating clean energy and implementing good waste management practices for our employees. We are also incorporating circular economy principles into our material procurement processes. While we actively collaborate with partners to contribute to the nation's transition 
puts green mobility infrastructure. We believe every small action, when replicated across our network, can lead to a significant change. We strive to foster an equitable and inclusive work environment by strengthening internal processes and enhancing digital learning platforms to empower and inspire our employees. It's not just about delivering mail and parcels. It's about delivering a brighter, sustainable future for Malaysians. In today's world, businesses have the power to make a difference beyond profits. They have the power to create a positive impact. That's why we have established Postcare, our corporate social responsibility arm to create a meaningful and sustainable impact for the local communities around us, leveraging on our logistics expertise. Post Malaysia is not merely traversing the length and breadth of a nation, but also pioneering a journey towards a greener, cleaner and a more prosperous tomorrow. That's it. So uh, with that, I say Trimakasi, thank you very much. It's a beautiful country and we want to keep it that way. So thank you. Perfect. So much. Thank yeah. you very thank much. You. Um, if you have questions, we have the first round, but I'm sure you're going to have questions. So just wait a, wait a second. Dr. Benter, the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda um, is, is really, I mean, about people. It's about prosperity. It's about businesses. How do you address uh, the sustainable development question at CTT? Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. I think, we, well, we tried to address uh, uh, um, the issue along those, those levers, although I'm, I'm bringing uh, uh, a, uh, an emphasis on something that we, as postal operators, often um, consider less uh, important. And I, I also have a very brief presentation. I'm going to start with that, if you allow me, and if this works. Green button. Green button, thank you. The move in our case is the beginning of the presentation. So, <clears throat> um, people, uh, climate, the environment, uh, uh, all stakeholders, uh, we are all there. But I'd like to start from a, a, a different perspective. When, when I came to this uh, job, my term is now four years old, uh, CTT had 69% uh, of its revenues on mail. And, uh, and those 70% of revenues would generate more than the full the margin of CDD, actually 108%. And in four years, uh, uh, last year, we, have, we, have, we had mail declining from 69 to 43% of our revenues, and the margin generated by mail came from 108% to 17%. 
in a growing company. And, and because we are listed, we are not a, a state-owned company, we are a, a, a fully listed company. We have guided for this year uh, an habit of, uh, a growing habit of 80 million. So the main issue when we talk about sustainability of a postal operator is to be able to diversify away from mail. Because uh, it, there's not much we can do about top line in mail, about bringing mail. Uh, and mail for us, as I believe for many postal operators, if not all, is, is, a management, is, is an issue of managing costs and efficiency. So for a postal operator to be sustainable in the first place, it needs to be economically sustainable and therefore diversify. And, and, the, and, and basically replacing uh, declining revenues from mail, from growing revenues in our case, mostly throughout the parcels business and the, and the small retail bank that we have, has been the path of transformation that we believe will make ourselves sustainable. But then, if we are economically sustainable, we need to do things in the right way so that, uh, again, uh, regarding climate, regarding carbon emissions, regarding people, uh, regarding uh, circular economy, we also do it in a, in a, in a different way. And, and that's why we have added to our, to our uh, motto, which is committed to deliver, the idea that we need to do that better in the sense that for mail, we need to be more efficient, faster, because we need to transform ourselves uh, fastly. Otherwise, we, we won't have the, the lift, the, the help that the, the mail revenues still provide us to transform the company, and obviously on a greener way. And then uh, the agenda is very much like everyone else. I would subscribe, subscribe, replacing Post Malaysia by CTD Portugal Post, most of the, the agenda. Is, is, is quite similar. So people, the climate, and of course, all the other stakeholders. Uh, and, and this is actually my last slide, just to summarize uh, uh, with some of the most relevant uh, aspects what, the, what the, our uh, sustainability agenda represents. So with this transformation idea of being able to uh, move, away, move away from mail, uh, and we try to have the agenda, of course, linked with, uh, with the, the UN SGD. So the most important one, we also have the help of advisors and we work quite thoroughly uh, in this agenda. Two years ago, we, we, we stated last year that we want to be net zero by 2030. I know it is extremely challenging with 100% of our green vehicles in the last mile uh, in, in that year and 50% of our fleet already uh, in 2025, which is, which is tomorrow. Actually, we have already, uh, again, also the largest uh, EV fleet in the country. Uh, and so this is, this is the most relevant aspect of our decarbonization agenda. We, we also, in Portugal, unlike Malaysia, we, we, we are lucky enough to be able to buy 100% of green electricity, certified green, but we are also producers of electricity. We can go along those lines later on. Uh, the second issue on this climate uh, aspect of the agenda is uh, about circular economy, where we want to reach 80% of recycled and reusable packaging by 2025, and uh, full recyclable or reusable materials by, by 2030, as part of our agenda. On people, uh, we have this issue, which is quite the present in the postal industry, at least in Portugal, uh, of uh, 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 women uh, uh, being less uh, common than, than they should. So we want to achieve gender parity in top and mid management. Actually, CTD is already a gender uh, 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 parity company because we have uh, roughly 44 or 46% of women, but not so much in, in higher ranks. And we need to actively manage that, which we are uh, uh, as we speak. Uh, and we also want to leverage uh, an employee centric culture uh, 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 with, the, with the specific emphasis on, on road safety for obvious reasons, because in our case, we are present in Portugal and in Spain, in Spain only with the parcels business. We travel roughly 200 million kilometers per year, very brown, and, 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 and so we need, to, we need to decarbonize that uh, activity, but we also do, want to do it in, in a safe mode. On, um, on, uh, on another note, uh, on the S uh, aspect of our agenda, uh, we, 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 we have a strong uh, uh, emphasis on, on our relation with, with our communities. Uh, any postal operator is a proximity uh, company. We are everywhere. We visit potentially everyone every day in its house. And we are, we, are, we, also, we are also spread along the territory. 
so we want to reinforce our presence in local communities. We want to have at least two thirds of our purchasing done uh, until 2025 with uh, uh, local uh, providers. And, uh, and we, 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 we have a very strong volunteering agenda. Uh, today, all the team building activities need to have a volunteering uh, uh, activity uh, related with contribution for the local communities. And finally, uh, mostly also because we are a listed company, uh, we need to have concerns in terms of government. Uh, one relevant aspect is this idea of having uh, ESG intent, intent incentives uh, for var variable remuneration for all uh, uh, relevant leaders and managers in the company, and of course, uh, uh, permanently uh, involve more and more and engaging our, our own people. So this is, in a, in a nutshell, uh, our sustainability agenda. Perfect. Thank you very much. Elena, I mean, you're here with, uh, with two hats that you're wearing. The one is, as I said already before, the head of the uh, chairperson of uh, the board of directors of Post Europe. And on the other hand, your responsibility for ESG within, within Koreas. So maybe you can talk a bit about both uh, the role of Post Europe in, in driving sustainability in all its elements uh, for its members. And of course, what you're doing at uh, Koreas. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for, for the invitation. Um, well, it's true, I, I'm a little bit different from you because uh, I work uh, for Correos, but I'm here with two hats, or uh, I would say with three, because I would also like to highlight uh, the important results of the Congress of the UPU regarding sustainability with the climate action approval and the objective of reducing, as a sector, uh, the 85 percent of the CO2 emissions by 2050, and I think it's something that we have to, to highlight and to, and to uh, congratulate the, the UPU and the UPU director general is here. So um, thank you very much for the push and, and congratulations for the, for the results. I will also uh, explain a little bit what uh, Post Europe is doing and uh, our aim and also a little bit the, the strategy of of Correos. Um, this is a, a, a drawing that I usually uh, use in this kind of presentations because I think that we are, we will talk today about the impact, the economic, social and the environmental impact of our, our sector, our postal operators. But uh, I think it's also very important to, to remind that uh, the planet is also impacting us. It's a two directions um, situation and it will impact our economy, our operations, our people, our society. So um, I, I really, I think all of us are very aligned regarding that we have to be greener, we have to be uh, faster in the transition and we have, we have to be more inclusive, uh, but really we have to be fast in this transition. Um, we are all, we know all the, the, the mega trends that are affecting the world, uh, rapid urbanizations, demographic change, switch into the economic power and political power, technologic, uh, technological breakthroughs. And one of the big impacts of these trends uh, is that now there are more tensions in the world and the tensions, the conflicts are affecting us all. Of course, in, if we talk about lives that are lost, but in terms of economy, in terms of operations, um, and I think that it's important to, to bear in mind that we are going through, a, let's say, in spite of our efforts to a less, um, maybe, um, a diverse or a less equal world, and we have to, to to, to work on that. Uh, regarding postal trends, I will just highlight the, the first one is the, the growing consumption and it's another challenge for operators. Um, uh, Joao first talked about the, the decrease in, in volumes in, in letters, which I think is obvious, but it's also true that the rhythm of uh, e-commerce growth is not, uh, is not the same as the growth uh, in the volumes uh, on parcels that we are managing. So I think it's also a uh, a challenge that we have to, to face. Uh, at, and at least in Europe, uh, we have an additional challenge that I would like to, to highlight, and is the, what we call the regulatory tsunami. We have different regulations that are affecting the way we are able to diversify, the way we are all, uh, able to, to operate. In some ways, they are boosting our, our transition, our transformation, but in other ways, it's also hampering our, uh, our uh, capabilities to, to, to compete with uh, operators or with uh, business that are outside of the, of the European Union. 
So what we are doing in, in post-Europe? Post-Europe is turning 30 years old, and we have been uh, 30, 30 years already uh, trying to boost postal sector, supporting members, uh, postal operators, in showing the impact and the, the value that we provide. And uh, we talk about the triple positive impact. Uh, we have uh, we are working on the on having a positive impact on the environment, and uh, on this regard, we are working on, of course, uh, the decarbonisation of our fleet. We have more than 30,000 uh, electric vehicles, and and the the number of uh, of alternative alternative vehicles is even higher. We have, and I think it's very important to talk about people here. I think more than uh, 1, 100,000 people is delivered by foot in Europe. And I think it's, it's very important. No, it's, nothing is more neutral than that. Um, and we are working also on increasing our energy efficiency with uh, photovoltaic, uh, photovoltaics, with, um, with uh, renewable energy. And we also uh, boost circular economy, uh, Recycle, reuse, etc., and we are also boosting all of us, all the, the the postal operators, on sustainable products and sustainable solutions. Uh, for example, partial lockers. If you use them, uh, you also try to you also help to reduce the, the footprint. Regarding the social uh, impact of um, of post Europe members, and this is also the the only the data of uh, European Union operators. We employ more than one million people in um, in Europe, which is more than the population in Amsterdam. Um, 60 60 percent of our team are devoted to delivery, and 50 almost 50 percent of women uh, of, of postal workers are women. It's true that we have the challenge and we see it today. Uh, we have two CEOs, I'm not CEO, and I'm the only woman here. Um, and we have the challenge to, to be able uh, to have more women in, in managing positions. Um, and we also um, help or we, we, we employ people that uh, the average is 45 years. And it is, it is an opportunity and as a challenge, we have uh, very uh, experienced people in our teams, but we are getting older. So we need a transition on this regard as well. And then if we talk about the economic impact, I think it's very important to, to remind that we connect every year, every day, uh, 800 million people. Uh, we manage 60 billion people, uh, 60 billion items per year. And we have more than 258 uh, million uh, delivery points. In, in total, uh, we contribute to our, to our country's GDP by 1%. But it's also true that if we go to the different postal operators and following the two IDP index by the UPU, we see that depending on the level of, uh, of, uh, of development of the postal operator, the impact on the GDP is even higher. For example, in, in the case of, of Correos, is six uh, percent, and I'm see, I, I think that uh, in the case of, of Portugal, that is even higher in the in the ranking. The impact on the GDP is even higher. So I think it's very important to uh, bear in mind that um, the impact of our uh, sector as a, as a as a global sector is very important in the in, in the economy terms but also in the environmental and, and social and then uh, if i just go very quickly uh, and talk a little bit about correos roadmap um, we have uh, you know this is the, the 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 general figures but what we i wanted to highlight here is that we are following a roadmap that is as uh, bernard said is holistic and i think when we are talking about sustainability we we just talk about sustainability and in our case we we were able to uh, to convince the strategy uh, department in order to talk about the eesg is economic environmental social and governance because we have to integrate is is the, we don't have to integrate the sustainability into the business we have to integrate the the the, the business into the sustainability because everything is interrelated and I think it's very it's very important so uh, what we have done uh, in our roadmap is to to 
uh, set very clear objectives regarding uh, these four pillars, economic, environmental, social and governance. Um, and then for 2023, our objective is to be neutral in uh, CO2 neutral uh, in scope one and two. Uh, regarding circularity, we will, uh, our aim is to be also a neutral, uh, a zero waste by 2030. And uh, the, with the aim of having 100% of our packaging uh, recyclable and reused. And uh, regarding our fleet, it will be at least 50% uh, with alternative vehicles. And our aim is also to support local businesses. And in this regard, our aim is that 100% of the total um, uh, products of Correos will be we will have either, if not both, either a positive impact on the environment or a, or a positive impact on the society. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elena. Um, I mean, when, when I look back, let's go maybe 15 years back in time, and when I remember some of the discussions that we had at the time, a bit more maybe than 15 years, but I remember some of those discussions when Postal operators introduced some things they were doing or starting to do in the area of sustainability. You know, there were people out there that say it's a trend, you know, that's one of those trends and it will go away anyway. And uh, will there be any, any real impact? But it has really changed. I mean, and uh, the three examples that we've heard here um, really show that um, sustainability plays really a huge role. But exactly that was, that's what I want to discuss with you here. Um, what role does it play in your organization? When we, when we look at the entire strategy of your organizations, what role does sustainability play in it? And how do you make sure it's really going everywhere in your organization, in all the decision-making processes, for example? Maybe, Joao, you want to answer that first? Well, uh, let's see. The, 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 the right thing to say now and fashionable is that there is no sustainability strategy. Uh, because the strategy is in itself uh, needs it's in itself to be sustainable. In our case, I think this illustrates uh, how much uh, how much we how much importance we we allocate to it. Uh, we had a, a capital markets day last year for the first time in five years, where we wanted to to uh, for the first time in our case, we are a bit older than post Malaysia. We are now more we are roughly one, 503 years old. We wanted for the first time to uh, provide targets, financial targets, economic targets, operational targets for uh, a three year uh, period ahead of us. And we wanted to have as part of that uh, set of commitments, uh, proper ESG commitments. That's why we, we studied so deeply how much would be the additional investment, the additional cost. Uh, um, in some cases, the reduction in efficiency that would allow us to be able to show a strategy that is a growth strategy, but needs to be sustainable. Uh, and so we have, we believe uh, we are, this is a learning process for, for us. I, I, I should humbly say so, but we have tried to put everything in place and we have started a new governance scheme whereby we have, we already had a small sustainability department, which is now uh, coordinated also with the, uh, with the IR department, just to see how important it is for the stakeholder and uh, shareholder and investors. Uh, we have uh, uh, at the executive team level, we have a so-called steering, ESG steering committee, and we have a board committee also related on, on ESG. Uh, and very much uh, in our decision or investment decisions or uh, operational decisions or efficiency decisions, uh, we have now filters that uh, are slightly stronger for a listed company because, because uh, from the regulatory side, the pressure is also huge. Uh, I would say that the, the reason why we need to do this is because mostly the customer stakeholder and the consumer, which is the, which is the customer of our main customers, the customers to the people to whom we deliver parcels or letters are in fact customer or customer of someone, some, someone, someone else. So, it's because of, in our case, the shareholders, the investors, but mostly the, our customers that the pressure uh, 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 is and with the regulatory uh, concerns that brings for, especially in terms of reporting, uh, the new taxonomy and so on. So everything needs to be filtered with this uh, ESG uh, and, and it's, it's a learning process uh, whereby we try to, to have it uh, uh, more and more present. But I believe it's also 
uh, uh, it also brings a, a, a dimension of, uh, I would say, a cultural change in the sense that it's very difficult to, 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 to have, well, to, to have uh, uh, filters uh, or, or um, a, 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 a police, ESG police that filters everything. So it's in fact something that needs to be embedded uh, when we design products, uh, when we segment customers, when we, when we define strategies, and, and that's, that's what we're trying to do. So it was one day, it was a trend, then it became fashionable, and now it is absolutely compulsory uh, because, well, customers demand so, customers, well, customers demand so, we need to we need to adhere to pledges of our some of our large customers. Uh, we need to we need to provide delivery serv uh, delivery services that uh, uh, at least in some areas of our for some segments need to be green today. Uh, and, and so the pressure is uh, is everywhere, and therefore the culture of of of, uh, of ESG and sustainability well is becoming more and more present in our, in our day to day life. Okay, Elena. Maybe your experience there. I mean, as I said, you have the head of Koreas, of course, but through post Europe, you, you know as well, you know, various different regions. Europe is big, so mm -hmm. there are many members with kind of different cultural backgrounds as well. Do you see differences there as well, or? Yeah, well, I think it has evolved a lot, and uh, during the last year, during the last months, we have been uh, working on the sustainability vision that we I just have shared, and what we have realized is that. Um, um, members are more and more involved in sustainability. They better understand the impacts uh, on economics, operational, etc. And, um, and that it was very important for all of us just to uh, insist and to show that sustainability is not just environmental, that it was social and it was economic, and, um, and also the, the, the impact of uh, regulation. So uh, last week, we, we, we approve in the plenary the, the new structure of the organization. And now, instead of the CSR uh, working group of transversal, the circle that we used to have, now we have what we call the ESG transversal. So to the, this ESG transversal, will um, some of the groups that uh, are reporting already to other, uh, other committees of the organizations will also inform and work together with the ESG. And it's regulatory, is the UPU, uh, the USC uh, committee, all um, uh, issues relating to operations and business, and then also social. So, and I think it, this, is, this shows how postal operators in post-Europe are also seeing this as a very holistic uh, and uh, holistic approach. And, um, and then regarding uh, Correos, we, we approved like three, four months ago um, a, a policy by which any decision that has the, uh, the, the, the management board has to take, it has to uh, have a, a, an impact on the environmental, social and economic in order to really uh, change the culture, as uh, Joao said, and incorporate really the, the triple uh, bottom up in the, in the decisions of the organization. Okay. Charles. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, th I think um, I'd echo what was already said. I, I, I think, uh, you know, we have three stakeholders involved. In I, I'd actually just take a couple of steps back. So, uh, like I said earlier on, transformation is tough. And, and any transformation, you have to have a huge amount of energy, a huge amount of passion, be really committed to it. Don't allow for any sort of uh, contradictions to it. So if you're, if you're embarking on a sustainability program, you can't then drive a Porsche into the office. It doesn't work, you know. So you have to look for congruency across the whole organization, whether it be the papers in a boardroom, your incentives or whatever else. So it's really looking at it, as you said, very holistically and saying, okay, do all the, does everything align? So that's point number one. Point number two is that, you know, and certainly from a Malaysia perspective, so in the last 12 months, Bursa, which is the capital markets, have introduced uh, sustainability targets for companies and organizations. So there is an elevated interest from the board, not just, and I, I don't want to, you know, just in case Data Ali reports back to my board. But um, my board is hugely supportive uh, and have been from the day I started. Um, but I think the interest level of sustainability has gone up considerably on the back of the requirements for board members to have a vested interest. So I think that really helps tremendously. And the last point I'd make is uh, in terms of transformation and culture in particular, and talking about culture is that, um, you know, and I talked a bit about this at previous events, just because 
we're super excited about it and super happy to go down this path and you know really passionate about it just like any change and this is a significant change it doesn't necessarily apply to every person and so you have to remember and i really learn this when I, mean, I learn every single day but i really learned this as we were starting to roll out our electric vehicles our electric bikes which Turu uh, very proudly owns and the first facility that we converted to uh, electric vehicles uh, we had about 15 postmen uh, in, in the location. And, and uh, on the day that we went live, uh, I think the, the day after we went live at the first facility, this is about nine months ago, I was so excited. I, I said, I'm going to go and see them and see the... I expected to walk into the building and find, you know, 15 postmen with big smiles on their face, eyes lit up, hugging me. You know, it's Charles, it's the best decision that anybody's ever made in Malaysia, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And just like any change program, you know, when I walked into the facility, a third of the postmen were excited. A third of the postmen were like, well, we'll see how it goes. And a third were, who made this decision? It's the worst thing possible. Do you not understand I got mountains on my route and whatever else? So, you know, it really, it, again, just reminds me, and again, I, I share it for those who are going through the same journey or about to embark on a similar journey. You have to start with the why. You have to really have to start with the why. Why are we doing this? It's not just because it's a fad. It's not a T-shirt. It's not a marketing campaign. It's not, I mean, I, I hate the phrase. It's not greenwashing. What's the reason? What's the reason why Post Malaysia needs to go down this path? Because it is a significant amount of effort in, in an already significant amount of effort going on elsewhere. So you have to start with the why, both internally and externally, and to your board, and to your investors, and, and we're publicly listed too. Um, so start with the why and, and then be really dogmatic around it. So uh, don't give up on any, you're gonna get a lot of hurdles, don't give up and you have to explain that why and win the head, the heart and the guts of your employees. The, the really wonderful thing is, and I said, we've been at this now about a year, a year and a half. Um, and the really wonderful thing is, um, you know, on that particular subject, now when I go, I go out every quarter to as many facilities as I can get to, and now I have couriers and postmen asking me, when do we get our electric vehicle? When do we get our bike? Because the customers love it. Other employees love it. Their families love it. Their friends love it. So that whole change, it's a typical change curve. So I think, uh, you know, just be very mindful of answering the why uh, before you embark and then go with it with huge amount of passion and you'll get there, yeah. So you were pointing here to the audience and saying, okay, some of you just start the journey sure. uh, at the very beginning. So, I mean, you all are in this journey already for quite some time. So the question is now, and, and here the culture is, of course, yeah. one of the things that pops up. I mean, you, 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 you have employees that embark on these kind of things that say, yes, we are on board. Yeah. And there are others that are, that are more critical about all these kind of changes that might not even believe in climate change or whatever. So, I mean, the, the question is, what are the main challenges that you have been facing over those past few years to really make it such an integral yeah. part of your strategy? Maybe, Elena, we start with you this time. Well, I think that... Um the change um, has to be, uh, in a way, top-down and, and bottom-up. We need uh, the cultural change uh, be both ways. Um, in, in the case of Correos, I think one of the main challenges is that um, I have been working in Correos for 20 years already, and I have met 10 CEOs. And the ESG strategy, the transformation, it will not stop because we uh, a new uh, CEO come. But it's also true that when there is a change in the in the team, in the management team, every decision is you know is a little bit slowing down. And 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 now all of the 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 team is really uh, really focused on sustainability, but. Uh, Seven years ago, I remember that when I first uh, presented the, the, the sustainability matrix, they, they were not engaged a lot uh, at all. And um, so I think um, the, 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 the key challenge for, for me is that to keep the track, to keep the, the, the transition and to, to be in, and, and to also to explain that uh, we are learning with this and we, can, we might have some mistakes and nothing happened. And uh, another challenge for me and the key challenge that I think we, we, we should work on, 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 the, on this is that we need to monetize the impact because still we are to, we, the economic impact is already there and it's easy, a bit, et cetera. But we need to um, 
specify or to monetize what is the impact of in the in the in the health of our community if we did the, if we, we reduce the, the CO2 emissions. Because um, if we don't do so, if we just go to the economics, we see that still the fuel vehicles are cheaper than the electric vehicles. So um, I think that the measuring the impact and, and monetize the, the social um, and environmental impact that we are having, I think, is key. Thank you. Charles? Uh, yeah, I'll go, I'll go back to so, so many, actually, yeah. <laughs> many, um, uh, but none that are insurmountable. You know, they're, they're, I wouldn't suggest for one second they're, they're show stop stoppers, but many. But I go back to the sort of three Cs. So um, the, the capability or the capacity of the organisation, I think, is one to really consider. Because, and again, you know, I think dif different markets are at different stages. But in Malaysia, because you know, it's still a fairly embryonic subject. When you talk about decarbonizing your, your, your fleet, for example, there are very few companies, if any companies in Malaysia that have gone through that. So when you're hiring a team in, you might, you get a lot of people with a lot of passion and a lot of energy, but in terms of experience and skill sets around, whether it be fleet, whether it be solar PVs, a little bit better on solar PVs or waste management or BEMS, I think the capacity of the organization, not only to take on what is a significant amount of work, but also with the experience and skill sets to be able to do that. I think that's one to really bear in mind. And, and again, you can solve to it, but it's definitely, uh, it, depending on where your country is, it's definitely a consideration. The second one is the capability of the, of the market. So like I mentioned, you know, when we first started, and just take Fleet as an example, there were only one provider of bikes and no, no provider of vans. Today, there are six or seven providers for vans and six or seven for bikes. And the, the rate of change on this is, is so fast. Um, and I was again talking, I talk about this quite regularly, that if we try and think forward four or five years in terms of what this will look like in terms of availability of providers, cost of units, it's going to change dramatically. So you have to remain very agile to the program because I don't think you should lock in, you know, what you're going to do for the next 10 years because it's going to be so different in terms of what's available. And the third one, and, and to the point, uh, cost. Um, so again, if you're, I don't have your 80 million euro profit, I wish I did. Um, but uh, when you're in a loss making environment, going to your board and to, your, in, to my CFO and saying, hey, we're going to do this, um, you, you get some strange looks. Now, in your scenario, Lena, so we've been really, really, really lucky. I mean, really fortunate to work with um, partners and vendors who have a similar passion and desire to be good for the planet and good for the p and um, And so it, we have a difference. We're really fortunate. Everything we've done on all of those six attributes, the cost of the asset or the cost of the transformation is less than the cost if I'd gone state to ice. So for example, um, and thanks to Tira and one or two others in this room, um, the cost of our electric vehicles that we're bringing in are coming in at a lesser cost than what we would have paid for if we'd gone to ICE, which is absolutely fantastic. In fact, for our bikes, it's a third of the cost. Um, so I can do three electric bikes for what it would have cost me for a, an ICE vehicle. And again, I share, just having gone through it recently ourselves, that there are 20, 15 to 20 vendors out there with two, three and four wheel electric vehicles. They are desperate for your business. Why? Because you have the largest fleets in most countries. They are desperate to have their vehicles sat in your post lot environment. So, um, and again, not true for everywhere. So I don't want to be unfair to anybody else, but you know, certainly from our perspective, whilst the cost is, is an is a absolute consideration and it has to be because of where we are fiscally, um, we've been really lucky to migrate from a CapEx to OpEx environment for most of those. So I'll take, take solar panels as one example. Um, the companies we work with are um, happy to do an OPEX model where you share on the save. So in effect, it costs me nothing. Yeah? It, I just get a 20% saving on my energy bill, which is absolutely fantastic. So I get a cleaner, greener building, which everybody loves, as I, as I mentioned earlier. I get an environment where I can charge my vehicles, which everybody is happy about, and I save money. I mean, it's, it's great for Planet and great for P&L. So to date, um, on that last one on cost, we've been very fortunate to the point where my CFO is now an advocate for it and runs around telling everybody, do more, do more. So, um, so, so far, so good on the, on the third element here. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's important to, to switch a little bit the language 
instead of talking about cost, is we are talking about investment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it, because it's, it's what it is in the in the end. So what well, I will I will get uh, you <laughs> out. <to. laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, well, I, I, I do subscribe to that. It's indeed investment in our future, because otherwise we won't be sustainable. I, I, I like very much this uh, I, uh, Charles' idea of, uh, of why, uh, because we have uh, many challenges. One of them is, is indeed cultural. And, and, and I, I come back to this transformation uh, requirement that we have uh, to diverse, diversify away from mail and mostly to parcels. Uh, 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 because uh, this is something that is, has, has been not very easy uh, 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 within us. Uh, CTT, Portugal policy is very unionized. We have uh, some of the largest unions in the country. Uh, we, up to recently, were a state-owned company. Ev although we are fully listed, everyone believes CTT is, well, it belongs to every Portuguese citizen. Uh, and so that, uh, that uh, uh, reactive uh, cultural against change is very, very high. So this is one new thing where there are less reasons for people to oppose, but is, but is a, a significant journey. Uh, 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 and uh, so I, I would probably elect cost. I, I'm not as lucky as, as Charles regarding um, uh, TCO. For us, uh, the decision of uh, replacing uh, our fleet uh, is, is a costly decision. Uh, TCO for an EV, a car, is still higher uh, in Portugal than it is for a normal vehicle. Uh, for bikes, well, we had recently, I have my CFO in the room, we, recently we had a decision that came three times to the to executive uh, committee uh, 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 board uh, uh, because uh, we, could, we, we could not avoid to, uh, to uh, replace a, a high number of bikes uh, um, with EV, well, because of uh, lack of uh, maintenance, uh, because of uh, uh, lack of um, autonomy, uh, because for some routes which are too long, the, well, the, the vehicle is not, is not enough. So we have a, a concern. We had a concern with, the, with the actual with supply, which is for cars is now globally uh, resolved, it seems. Uh, we have a very strong uh, concern with the, with the charging infrastructure. Uh, we have, we've just closed a, a tender whereby CTT Portugal Post will have the largest private uh, charging uh, infrastructure in the country, which is, which is unfortunate because it should be, it should be there, uh, because the transition is a transition for everyone and for the country. So we, we have a few challenges on, 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 uh, on, cult, on the cultural side, on, on the supply side. Coming back to the why, uh, part of, the, of this journey has been done together with the uh, uh, CTT certifying itself as a so-called uh, family-friendly company, which is in fact it was certified by a Spanish uh, entity, and and one of the on, of the dimensions is in fact uh, we need to well to put everything together. So we want to be sustainable. We want to be a better company. People need to feel better. We are now measuring uh, employee uh, commitment and engagement on a very objective way. We are very unhappy with the results. Uh, so we, we know that we need to improve. Uh, we are promoting women. Uh, I, I believe Elena doesn't mind for me to tell that Elena is the chairman of Post Europe and has a mother of five, five children, which is almost impossible uh, in, a, in Iberia. So it, it, it represents a, a huge effort and we need to transform our companies to be able to, uh, well, to promote women uh, within the companies and to allow them to reach uh, uh, high positions, we need to reshape the way we, we organize ourselves. So this is all part of the change that we are doing and sustainability is, is probably today the, the nicest uh, 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 target and goal uh, in the room because it helps in our transformation journey. I open now to the floor here. Who has questions to pose? Please. There are two questions over there. <clears throat> Please state also who you are so that uh, yeah, the panelists... My name is Graham Lee. I'm an independent consultant uh, uh, providing policy, regulatory and strategy advice to, uh, to post mainly in developing countries. But on the theme of sustainability, I was reminded last year I, I, at Post Expo, there was a presentation by Deutsche Post and, and Deutsche Post were telling us how wonderful they were with their delivery vehicles. And they said, we, we've got these software that allows us to have these great routes and we're 99% efficient. 
The next presentation was by Hermes, who said, we've got a different software, but we're 99.5% efficient. Then there was a third presentation. And what strikes me is that we're saying, right, we've got all these operators that are wonderfully efficient in their own terms. But by definition, the fact that we've got 10, 15, 20 operators providing routes in the same areas um, means that we're actually inefficient as a whole. And therefore, when, when will regulation come in that says, actually, we don't want, and I, I was just speaking with uh, someone before who said in some cities that it's already taking place where regulation is, they will be reducing the number of operators and even saying, actually, Kuala Lumpur, for example, will only have one or two licensed operators. Um, what, when will that happen? Um, and, and even further with regulation of, of, of saying, regulation of actually every company above a certain size must have electric vehicles. Uh, what do you think the impact will be on, uh, on our sector in particular? So I can dive in, as you mentioned, Kuala Lumpur. Um, so, so a couple of, oh, a few comments, three. Um, first of all, that's been talked about uh, for a long time, you know, shared space. And, and to be fair, it happens in certain, to a certain degree, you know, so even I, I was DHL in the, in the day, so before uh, I moved into the post sector, DHL Express. So we had share, shared volumes even in, in post Malaysia today. Uh, so there's Peninsula Malaysia and there's East Malaysia. East Malaysia is 2x, 2.5x the size of Peninsula in Malaysia. So we already do deliveries for other carriers. In fact, again, our regulator, MCMC, has a document uh, called Package, which talks about how uh, carriers need to come together. Now, that's, so that's point one. Point two is, albeit it's been talked about forever, I've seen very limited evidence of it ha actually happening because, and, and I guess, you know, the question is always why? Why is, that, why is that the case? Why do you have a red van, a yellow van, a blue van, a green van, a brown van? all going to Munich or wherever it may be, yeah? I guess because that's kind of where most of the carriers believe the competitive advantage is. And if you give up that competitive advantage for the customer, if it's a white neutral van, what's the reason I'd use that company versus that company if you don't add any value in the last mile uh, space? So I think most of the reason it hasn't happened is that most carriers believe that there is competitive value in operating it independently yourself. The third one is, uh, I'm not saying that's right or wrong, I'm just saying that's, a, that's why I think it hasn't happened. The third point is that, um, and to your question, when may that change? If it was, re I think it would, the regulation would need to be in place for it to change. So for example, and some cities are already, as you know, some cities in Europe and some cities in Canada and some cities elsewhere in the world are already stipulating that your vehicle has to be this type of vehicle to come into the market. You have to look at sort of aggregate volume. You have to look at lockers. You have to look at different systems within intent to reduce the, the amount of cars and, and vehicles on the road, but also to improve the environment. The more that's ma a mandatory environment, so if, if tomorrow Kuala Lumpur, for example, said, if you want to operate in Kuala Lumpur, you have to operate under these conditions, you have no choice. You have to find a solution to it. So I don't, in my humble opinion, I'm not so sure it'll ever be volunteered because of point number two. It would be a case of reacting to a regulatory environment. Yeah, not to say that we don't explore it and we do some stuff with other carriers. So we have two aircraft flying um, under scope three missions, two aircraft flying into East Malaysia. Um, every single day and we, we, we sell that space to other carriers. So there is some activity. I'm not so sure it's done necessarily from a sustainability perspective. It's probably done more from a commercial perspective, but it does happen, but it's not necessarily volunteered, I think, in the way that you, you perhaps are describing. Oh, well, I also believe it would, be, it would be nice to happen. Uh, I believe it's, uh, it's very hard to happen. I mean, I'd, I'd love that to happen tomorrow if I would be the provider of that delivery and I would hate if I would be compelled to do it uh, to someone else. So we have, we have also a few experiments. We are doing uh, that with the, with, the, with the relevant municipality around Lisbon, Cascais, a very well-known place that uh, is trying to do that. But the, the regulatory framework is actually uh, very, very hard because somehow it would harm competition and, and, and it's not easy. And, and it didn't happen for beverages, for, for any, any, uh, other types of supply, even with strict regulations. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to compel people to, well, to organize themselves in a competitive lands landscape. On the other hand, we are doing something uh, at CTD Portugal Post, uh, 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 which is also sometimes uh, 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 sounds strange when we talk about this. We have launched a, a locker uh, operation. Actually, it's, it's a small company uh, inside the company. The CEO is in the, is in the room. 
uh, a young manager of ours, uh, uh, and uh, what, we, what we did, we decided to open this network to other operators. Uh, why are we doing this? Well, for several reasons. One of them is because uh, if we populate the country with a very dense uh, uh, network of lockers and it's open, there's no incentive for others to invest. So for, this is a defensive move. I can say this openly and should say so. On the other hand, because I'm actually helping others to uh, uh, give me part of their revenue in, in for, the, for, the, for, the, for the last mile delivery, which is good for our business. And, uh, and finally, because it also allows me to know a little bit uh, about uh, those competitors of mine that believe that for them is more efficient to use my lockers or to use myself to deliver their parcels in my lockers than anything else. And this, of course, provides for higher efficiency in terms of carbon emission, in terms of, in terms of uh, well, efficiency in, in general. So there are ways of the, the market to organize itself in a competitive landscape that promotes what we, what we are aiming to achieve. Uh, I have also, like, like Charles said, a bit doubtful that someday regulations will compel us to do uh, something along those lines. If I, if I may just add one other point uh, to your comment you made. So the other thing is, and again, I'm, I'm not sure it's like in everybody else's market, but um, you know, Malaysia, uh, we have 120 uh, operating licenses or roughly 120 operating licenses. And one of the recommendations we made to our regulator uh, uh, great people, by the way, they're here. Um, and one of the recommendations we made is, you know, it's too easy for a foreign carrier to enter Malaysia and start operating with another van. To, I mean, to your question, it has other implications, but, you know, you, you can come into Malaysia tomorrow and start with, a, with a, you could buy a defunct license or a, a, a license that's gone, not operating anymore, but still holds the license. So there's plenty of ways to enter Malaysia and start operating, as there are in many countries, but you're adding another, you know, one plus one, you know, another, another van, another van. So one of the recommendations, and to Jao's point, is we said, well, look, the, Post Malaysia has the best network in Malaysia, period. Yeah, we go to every single address, every single mountain, every single hill, every single cave, every single beach. We go to every single place in Malaysia. No one else comes close, yeah? So if you want to let a foreign ca uh, carrier into Malaysia, sure. But then they use Post Malaysia's network to do that. So I, but again, to the point, I don't think it's a voluntary environment. It has to be a regulated environment where there's a structural change to how you can operate in a country. And, and, and again, as Zhao said, I, I would love to see that for very selfish reasons. Um, and, but I think it's the right thing. To, I mean, you can't just keep adding a pink van, a green van, a blue van, a red van. It's, it's probably just not good for many, many reasons here. Yeah. Not just sustainability. Yeah, uh, well, I really agree with you. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's really a challenge because what, is really, what it really means is a change in the system. Uh, because until now, uh, if, we just, if I just talk about the European Commission, um, they are uh, boasting a competition. And thanks to that, we have uh, 5, 10, 20 postal operators delivering at our homes. Um, we are in, in Correos. We are uh, participating in a senator in, in a project, in a European Union project, Horizon 2020, that is called Senator. And the objective of that was to specifically advance on this: is okay. Let's have, let's see if we ha can have like a control tower for the municipalities in order for them to manage. Um, what are the operators, not only your logisticals, logistical, but we will focus on logisticals now, that are able to enter into the city in order to avoid the overlapping of, of, of the networks. And um, what happened now is that it has been, uh, we have two pilots, one in Zaragoza, one uh, a city in Spain, and in, in Dublin. And what happened is that we have been not able to deliver we have not been able to implement the pilots. In Dublin, it has been impossible because um, this uh, system uh, forced the companies to first uh, give you personal data, and the current framework of personal data protection in Europe doesn't allow that. Um, then it'll, it also forced you to have um, as many IT devices as operators entering in the same network, because non, not all of us are using the same. So the, 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 the challenge has been so big that we have not been able to, to achieve it. And is, we have uh, explained that to the European Commission. In the case of Spain, we are currently implementing the pilot. 
but it's just thanks to the subsidiary of Correos. So we are just doing the cross-docking between Correos uh, and, and, and Correos Express. Otherwise, it has been not possible because even if we have some um, meetings with, uh, with competitors, with other operators, in the end, they were not able to, to, to share the, the, the data either for competitive reasons, because in the end uh, we, are, we are competing among, uh, among ourselves, and also because of, of the current regulation that is, is there. So, and, and regarding my, my, my first uh, slide, um, I think it's important to remind that some of the regulation that are already in place are contradicting with each other. And to operate in this environment is really, really challenging. Thank you. We started a few minutes late, so we have a few minutes more, I take it. Um, so for two more questions, and I've seen two hands up, one here in the front, but first uh, one in the back. Um, I, I, I the mic. The mic was already here, but oh, here as well one. Yeah, uh, but three questions. Okay, but if we have three <laughs> questions, then you direct the question to one of the panelists so that not all three of them need to reply, okay? Because then <laughs> we wouldn't have enough time. But I want to allow the three questions. Okay, go ahead. Sure. So it's Peter Dunn from Cullen International. Um, so, understandably, the, debate, the presentations today have focused on uh, what the operators themselves can do, uh, what you might call scope one and two emissions. Um, but as with most other sectors, and I think Postal is not different to this, scope three emissions are going to be very, very significant, harder to control, but very significant. And uh, Mr. Brewer, in your video, there was a, a slide on eco consumerism. So I wonder what actions or strategies you have to try and encourage or nudge or incentivize consumers into behaving more ethically or more environmentally friendly way. Is that, sorry, is that to me? Uh, um, so I'll tackle the scope three one first, mainly because it's harder. Um, it is harder. So I think. Um, so, so our journey is a bit of an evolution. So we said, let's deal with what we can control first, deal with what we can actually own and, and do something about. So hence why we focus on scope one and two, and I guess why most companies focus on scope one and two, yeah? Uh, so that's point number one. Point number two is, and we just spoke about this, um, so we have a regular, obviously, sustainability meeting reviewing how what progress we're making, and we just spoke about this, saying that probably now, as most of the six work streams are in play and are, are on track, um, and I feel very comfortable with where they are, not to suggest or say they won't change and there'll be some puts and takes going forward. Now is a good opportunity for us to start looking at scope three. So two elements to that. Um, one is um, you know, procurement. Uh, so we haven't to date um, sat down with our top 50 suppliers, for example, and talked about our journey and where we want to go and how they play into that. Yeah? So that'll be action number one is communicate to the, to the, to the vendors this is post Malaysia's journey and this is what we expect from you if you want to be a vendor from us going forward. In itself, sounds easy. It, 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 the communication part's very easy, but for them to partake in our journey, a lot tougher because like I said, and again, I love Malaysia with all my heart, but it's still a fairly embryonic stage in terms of sustainability. So as it was for post Malaysia to step very heavily into that transformation, that change curve, it'll be a big shift for vendors to hear one of their biggest buyers say, if you want to be part of Post Malaysia's future, you need to be doing the same thing and we need to, you need to show evidence, but it's the right thing to do. So I think hopefully that answers sort of the scope three with, with one exception. So as I mentioned earlier, we have two aircraft we operate uh, in Malaysia. That's a much, 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 much tougher one. And, and again, somebody asked about DHL earlier, they just announced yeah. buying 168 billion gallons of, you know, green fuel, et cetera, but we just don't have that money. Um, so for us to go to our supplier who, who operates the two aircraft and tell them they need to convert, um, we can tell them for sure, but I, I know their fiscal situation too, and I think that'll be a longer journey and a longer discussion. Now we potentially can find alternatives to it, um, so we're not gonna shy away from that discussion, but I think it'll be tougher, particularly for that, for those two specific uh, cases. Um, other vendors, not so, not so difficult. So, oh, sorry, so, you're gonna finish. And, and the second, that's okay. And the second question, remind me, second question was uh, consumers. Yeah, so real simple. So uh, t two parts to that. Uh, one is packaging, like you saw in the video. So uh, my marketing head's in the room, and she got quite depressed by this. I said, you know, just using colour on plastic 
is massive impact in terms of um, in terms of your greening strategy. So we removed all the colour. My, my Fiona, my head of marketing, nearly fell off the chair when I suggested we should do it. Um, but it's the right thing to do. The packaging is now 80% from recyclable um, products. So th that part of it's quite easy and quite straightforward. You can do it at a lower cost too. So you remove that colour. It costs you less to buy the packaging anyway. And to be honest with you, when you order a, a T-shirt online, do you care if the packaging is pink, green, or orange? Doesn't care. It just goes straight in the bin, you know, which is a really sad part of life, yeah? So, so it's an easy thing to do. Don't be so proud about the brand. Just accept it and suck it up and get on with it. So that's an easy one. And then the other thing, we're doing things like recycled packaging, same thing. I'm really, in fact, I'm quite keen to talk to a few other postal operators, how they do that. Uh, Sing Post do it a little bit, um, and a few other postal operators, you know, started getting into the space of asking consumers to recycle the packaging back through the provider. So we'll look at that too, but we, we're not there just yet. Not just there just yet. Great. Last question, please. Yep. I'm Jakob Voorspij, I'm an independent consultant now, used to work for a standardization body, GS1, for like eight years, 20 years before that with uh, DHL, so I think I have some uh, right in asking this question to Elena. Well, I don't actually understand at all why these pilots don't start, because there are already standards that are well developed and well proven, for instance, in uh, New Zealand and in Australia, where there is a common uh, standard for the 2D barcode that's on the box and they can easily exchange that same box and everybody can read that same 2D barcode. So this exchange between these carriers and even let's say the exchange points, urban consolidation centers, all of which can be based on standards that have been out there for a couple of years now and well proven. So honestly, I don't understand why in Europe we don't know about these things that are ongoing there and why we should not implement them in your project. Honestly. Well, I think it's, it's, it's not a matter of standards. I think one of the, of the big uh, groups in the, in the UPU is standardization. And I think we are all uh, uh, working through standards. The, the issue here is, is that um, the, the, it impacts the way we communicate. Uh, we, from a legal point of view, we cannot transfer data, uh, personal dat data from our clients to, to other one due to the uh, regulation. It's on the label. It's already being exchanged physically. Uh, it, is, it is not uh, staying with, with, the, with the postal operator. And then it, it will also have an impact on, on as I said, is, you know, we, we are trying that. So it's, it's, it's not that, uh, Postal operators uh, are not trying. Uh, Joao also explained that they are also uh, trying to implement this kind of pilots, but it's not easy. And it's not just regulation and it's not just standards. There are many, many, other, uh, many other aspects to, to, to bear in mind. And then if we just open a little bit more the, the scope or the sectors impacted, we will, it will not be just the postal operators that are investing in, in fleet, uh, decarbonization, etc. It will, in fact, in fact, uh, imply that it will uh, have less um, less purchase from the vehicles manufacturers, and it will also imply that we also have to uh, base probably on just one IT platform. So again, um, I think it's, it's very challenging. But even though we are we are working on it, so. It's, it's just a matter of, of time, I think, and, and, and trial and error, and, and we are learning in this, in this case. Perfect. Thank you very much, Elena. Um, we have to finish here. It was a great panel. Thank you very much for all the insights and, and, and all the expertise that you have shared here for all your visions. That will also very much, of course, influence our discussion in the afternoon when we dive into more of the strategies. So please give a big applause to our three panelists here. Thank you. Um, let's make a 15 minutes break. Let's be back at 11.15, okay? <laughs>